Temporal Loss, Eternal Gain. This is part ten of the City of God from Book One. The saints lose nothing in losing temporal goods. So to begin with, we know from the previous part of the book that bad things happen to good people in order to push them towards God. To justify why the loss of Rome and the empire meant nothing to the Christians, Augustine of Hippo emphasizes that there are true gains to be had in spiritual gifts and disciplines that are worth more than material goods, wealth, and other earthly treasures, to which are all temporal and forfeit. We know that all things work together. For good to them that love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Romans chapter eight verse twenty-eight. Because God is sovereign and always in control, pain, suffering, and death in this world are all being used to bring about good and to show His glory and purpose on us all. Losses. They lost all they had. Their faith, their godliness, the possessions of the hidden man of the heart, which in the sight of God are of great price. Augustine references First Peter chapter three verse four, which states that, "But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price." This harkens back to when Christ emphasized the importance of having a good heart, just as the meek man who prayed in secret did, instead of the Pharisees who announced their prayers in public so that they could impress others. This also relates to the Beatitudes, in which Christ says in Matthew chapter five verse five, "Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth." And First Peter chapter three verse four references to the great price, which connects. To the pearl of great price from Matthew chapter thirteen verse forty six. In essence, Augustine highlights that the spiritual gifts of meekness and a heart of faithfulness towards the purposes of God shows to the Christian that he or she has everything that they need beyond that of lacking material possessions. God desires our hearts most of all, and that our possessions mean little and less since everything belongs to Him anyway. Temporal wealth or heavenly wealth? For these are the wealth of Christians, to whom the wealthy apostle said, "Godliness with contentment is great gain." For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Which drown men in the destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We should be content with the little that we have. For just having our basic and spiritual needs met can be a joy into itself, beyond the pitfalls of greed, temptation, and the tyranny of sin. Notice how the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil, not necessarily money itself. That is because just as anything can be turned into an idol, excessive love of money or greed can inspire people to commit the most heinous of acts, and even to go against their very own values and morals. We must watch ourselves and stop ourselves from erring. Augustine also says that even the poor can have the love of money and greed. Quote, These two, however, had perhaps some craving for wealth and were not willingly poor with a holy resignation. And to such it had been made plain that not the actual possessions alone, but also the desire of wealth, deserve such excruciating pains. Basically, those who didn't make vows of poverty but were poor due to their disposition can also have. The love of money, affected by greed in their hearts to do wicked things, it is not a condemnation of wealth, but a love of it which is a sin. Quoting the words of Job, "Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. As it pleased the Lord, so has it come to pass. Blessed be the name of the Lord." Job chapter one verse twenty one. Augustine then goes on to explain, like a good servant, 
Job countered the will of his Lord, his great possession, by obedience to which his soul was enriched. Nor did it grieve him to lose, while yet living, those goods which he must shortly leave at his death. One must consider Christ as the pearl of great price to the exclusion of all other temporal things, which are merely idols. Obedience and sufferings, which produces hardship and character, help sanctify us and highlights the matters that are of chief concern. To not store up treasure for this life, to which can be affected by rust. And moths, as according to Matthew chapter six verse nineteen, but to store treasure in heaven and cultivate your spiritual gifts and disciplines that, as a result, sanctify the soul and foster your relationship with God. Augustine then says in Matthew chapter six verse nineteen, for if many were glad that their treasure was stored in places which the enemy chanced not to light upon, how much better founded was the joy of those who, by the counsel of their God, Had fled with their treasure to a citadel which no enemy can possibly reach. Since in Augustine's time, during Rome's fall, many were seeking sanctuaries in the churches, whether it be the Christians or the pagans. Augustine emphasized that the true sanctuary is God. Augustine then gives an example of how trusting in God as the sanctuary. Thus, our Paulinus, Bishop of Nola. Who voluntarily abandoned vast wealth and became quite poor, though abundantly rich in holiness, when the barbarians sacked Nola and took him prisoner, used silently to pray, as he afterwards told me, "O Lord, let me not be troubled for gold and silver, for where all my treasure is, Thou knowest." For historical context, Paulinus was born in Bordeaux. He had inherited and married into great wealth. By age thirty-six, he converted to Christianity and gave his wealth to the poor. By four hundred and nine A.D., he became the bishop of Nola, and then was taken by Alaric, the first king of the Visigoths, after Rome's sacking. In essence, Paulinus was a faithful Christian who was serious about what Christ said, giving to the poor, preaching the gospel, and taking up his cross. Taking up his burden and suffering so that others can be saved. Though those who are worldly minded might remark that he has lost everything, Paulinus in fact had gained something much more: spiritual disciplines, devotion, and a test of his faithful character. Endurance. But some good and Christian men have been put to the torture. That they might be forced to deliver up their goods to the enemy, they should endure all torment, if need be, for Christ's sake. That they might be taught to love Him rather, who enrich Him with eternal felicity, or who suffer for Him, and not silver and gold, for which it was pitiable to suffer, whether they preserved it by telling a lie. Or lost it by telling the truth. For under these tortures, no one lost Christ by confessing Him. No one preserved wealth save by denying its existence. Of course, Augustine is not advocating for torture, but on the contrary, he stated that those who endure it have something more to gain. That they prove not only to themselves but also to God that they are faithful. And willing to be martyred for the faith, we endure our suffering time and time again because we have not learnt to be truly at ease, to truly place our faith and treasure in heaven, to adore the heavenly treasure and pearl of great price, which is the Christ, the Son of God, to whom is the standard of love and mercy. And though it was scarcely to be expected that the barbarians should believe him. Yet no confessor of a holy poverty could be tortured without receiving a heavenly reward. Augustine says that those who make themselves low and vow poverty gain treasures in heaven, a spiritual maturity that allows one to properly love God and others beyond the temptations and distractions of the world. Augustine also finally emphasizes the gift of heaven and eternal life of the bodily resurrection for those. Whom famine killed outright, it rescued from the ills of this life, 
as a kindly disease would have done, and those who were only hungry bitten were taught to live more sparingly and inured to longer fasts. Those who died with faith in God are with Him, while those who endure the pains and sufferings of life are still learning and being sanctified as a result. In conclusion, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain, even if we lose the temporal goods, because Christ has offered us eternal life and a relationship with Him that goes beyond the sufferings, pains, hungers, thirsts, tortures, temptations, and lusts of this world. We become sanctified, endure hardships, and build character in this life. And when our hour has finally come, then as Paul in Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 stated, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I'll end this video with a reading from 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 17 to 19, about focusing on the things of God. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold in eternal life. Thank you for watching, and be sure to check out my other videos on the topic of the City of God, or on the topic of Rome, or psychology, or any other number of videos. Thank you. Bye-bye.